We're going to talk, first of all, about the concept of heat stress and where your fire suit plays into this. And I have one message from this, and the message is wear your underwear. So why do you wear it? Prevents chafing, protects you from the elements, but the real element is fire. And you heard a great deal about fire in the past. Well, un unfortunately, fire has not gone away. We still burn fuel, and the, the word there is burn, and fuel makes fire. So when it's not in the engine and it's all over you, that's not a good thing. So that's a picture of Indianapolis in 1964 uh, when two drivers were killed in a horrific fire. And in 1965, the first Nomex garment was uh, prepared by J.B. Hinchman and Company in Indianapolis. Uh, that was the first use of DuPont's new fabric Nomex in a racing situation. The idea of your fire suit, of course, is to protect you from the fire. But at the same time, you'd like for it to be reasonably comfortable. And one of the biggest issues right now is the balance between thermal protection, a fire suit, and prevention of heat stress, which is heat buildup and causing your core temperature to go up, that's been recognized for a long time and that there are specific things about your fire suit that will lessen the risk of having a heat illness. Fire doesn't really care how old you are, uh, how fast you're going, uh, what kind of car you're driving. Human skin burns at the same temperature regardless of any of those facts. So the protection becomes important from the standpoint that you want to have a material that is fire resistant. There's no such thing as a fireproof garment. The two fabrics right now that are pretty much still the gold standard are either Nomex or Carbonex. They're in of themselves not the same because the fiber size can be different. Uh, how the, the cloth is woven, how many layers, how the fabric's been treated, if it's been chemically treated to make it less flammable. And then the, the comfort parameters, what does it feel like? Well, fortunately or unfortunately, a thousand dollar suit feels a whole lot different than uh, the men's warehouse hundred dollar suit. And the fire suits are the same idea. They, they have a, a hand, which is how they feel to you. Probably one of the most important for um, being comfortable from a heat standpoint in your fire suit is the easiest to test. Pick it up, put the inside against your mouth, and blow through it. If you can blow from the inside of the fire suit out without any restriction, that's a very air permeable fire suit. And that's important because what cools you off in the fire suit is the uh, sweat, the heat of sudation, which is a fancy way of saying when the sweat evaporates off of your skin, it cools you, it takes heat out of your system. So ideally you would like to sweat inside your fire suit and have the fabric that's against your skin move that moisture out of the suit. So it has a moisture vapor transmission rate. It's how fast moisture moves through the suit. It, the breathability is the, the blow test thing. And then the comfort. How stiff is it? How abrasive is it? I mean, we've all had fire suits. I've spent a lot of time in a fire suit because I sat in a truck and a fire suit all day. And having one that was stiff or abrasive was not pleasant. We wore all the stuff that we're supposed to have on because if I'd been burning a fire, I would never heard the end of it. Okay, so what your fire suit does is it provides thermal protective performance, how it protects you from fire. And there, there's a, a formula and a terminology called thermal resistance. The higher the value of that, the better the fire suit is at protecting you from being burned. It has comfort characteristics, which you'd like for it to breathe. You want it to be uh, open or have the sense that it's open. So it has a permeability index. How well does moisture, vary, moisture vapor move through it and how well does it breathe? So th those two characteristics are what define a comfortable fire protective garment that won't allow heat to build up inside of it because you don't want to be raising your core temperature because you have a fire suit on. So these two measures are, are the things that you're looking for. The comfort measures how permeable 
and how well does moisture move through the suit. What makes a fire suit cool you off is it has to move moisture from your skin into an airspace through the fabric into the outside air. So you have a micro environment inside the suit and you're trying to move moisture outside the suit um, to the macro environment. So it, by adding a layer of underwear that does not absorb water, so a cotton shirt is the worst thing you can wear under your fire suit. It gets wet, it holds the water, it won't pass it through the suit. So that's why your fire suit underwear inside the suit actually makes it cooler, not hotter. And that, that's proven. Because you hear all kinds of, well, it's too hot to do this. And unless you particularly don't like your arms and legs, a short sleeve underwear shirt or short pants underwear shirt, yeah, works fine if you don't care about having legs or arms, but it's not a great idea if you do. When you go to buy one and you go on the shelf, on the sleeve now it'll have, if it's in Europe, it's got a FIA standard. In the U.S., it's an SFI standard. And the standard for fire suits usually is a 3.5A and then slash a number. Well, the number is the SFI grade, and that relates directly to how long it takes for you to get a second degree burn in a gasoline fire in that fire suit. The standard racing fire suit is a 3.2A slash five, okay? So in that, you get 10 seconds before you get burned. Okay, so if you're in a fire in your fire suit, you got nothing on underneath it, just the fire suit, you got 10 seconds in a gasoline fire. Um, and then you get a second degree burn. It looks something like this. That's not exactly what you'd like to have. And the fire suit will eventually burn. It, it's material, it's not fireproof, it's fire resistant. Now, this is probably the, the more, most important thing I can show you. We took a mannequin, put a fire suit on the mannequin, turn this butane torch on it, it takes a 40 degree centigrade rise in temperature to cause a second degree burn. So in this fire suit with that torch, it's gonna to take 47 seconds to go up 40 degrees centigrade. Now, this is the same experiment. The only difference is the mannequins got on a underwear sleeve underneath the fire suit. You get more than double the time out of this. So if it's cooler, and it's safer, why wouldn't you wear it? It's just that simple. That's the message that I want to get home to you about a fire suit, is, is that it works well, it's designed to work well, but it's designed to work with the underwear under the fire suit. So you don't want to have exposed skin, you know, wearing your, your racing shoes with no socks, not a good idea. Uh, wearing cotton socks and no fire socks over the top of them, a worse idea. Um, I went to this quarter scale drag race deal and, and was having a heart attack because of all the long hair and we'll go to that in a minute. Um, the, the young ladies were trotting around in their camisoles and so on and so forth before they put their fire suit on over the top of them. And one of the things that one of our, my associates was passionate about were, were women and their undergarments. Synthetics will melt before you burn. So not a great idea to have a, and I'm not picking on Victoria's Secret, but that draws the image that everybody knows about, to have one of those things on underneath your fire suit and call that underwear. And if it has an underwire, that just heats up and burns you like a branding iron. So there are fire retardant bras. Stan 21 has a very nice one that my wife helped design. She was the test dummy for it. Uh, these are just characteristics for, for fire suits, and we're not going to go through all the numbers. I do want to make one last statement about this before we go on. If you have long hair, guy or girl, doesn't matter. We had a guy that had really nice blonde hair that the girls all love, um, shoulder length. You got long hair, you have to put it away so that it's not hanging out of your helmet. And two things do that. You can't tie it up in a top knot like Bam Bam and then try and pull your helmet down over it So, because the helmet won't go down on your head. So that sort of defeats the purpose of the helmet. And we actually had one of the young ladies, uh, 
uh, one of our drivers come and do a symposium for girls about how to flat braid uh, hair so that it stayed flat against the, the skull and the back of the neck and then put a balaclava over it and tuck the balaclava in to your shirt so that it's all tucked away and then the fire suit over it. The reason hair is, is so critical is if you remember during the BP oil spill in the Gulf, they collected up all this human hair because it mechanically binds hydrocarbon. It has a property that causes oil to be deposited on the surface and it sticks there. That's why you girls, we all get oily hair. If oil sticks to your hair and you're in a fire, now you're a wick. So really not a good idea. So cover it up and you do that with a balaclava. If you doubt, you know, is it worth doing? Without going through all the numbers, for about $1,800, you can kit yourself out with a really nice set of gear. A trip to the emergency room, you walk through the door, it's going to cost you 13 grand. That's on the low end. That's if you don't do anything. That's just go in and say hi, get a few blood tests, a couple x-rays, maybe a CAT scan. And if you're hurt, the price just keeps going up. And most of you will have at least $1,000 deductible insurance if you have insurance for it at all, which is a whole nother talk about knowing that. That's the spiel on fire. Now, I want to do a really quick deal here about head and neck supports. There's a lot of misunderstanding about what a frontal head restraint is. The new terminology for what a Hans is. Hans was head and neck support, and unfortunately, it made it sound like it was supposed to do something for your neck, all right? So we're gonna talk very briefly about what a frontal head restraint accomplishes. That's what a Hans is. There's an area at the base of your brain called the Atlanta occipital junction. It's where your neck fastens to your head. It, it's all ligamentous. There's no bony attachment. Your, your head is a ball on a stick. Your neck's the stick, your head's the ball. And it's held on by rubber bands, basically. And in a injury that causes your head to be accelerated, or a phenomenon that causes your head to be accelerated faster than the rest of you, uh, or than your neck, it literally pulls your head off. That's what a basilar skull fracture is. The ligaments pull the bottom of the skull off. It's usually fatal. There are two ways you can get a basilar skull fracture, and before motorsports, most everybody thought it was because you ran into something with your head and it pushed the head down on the neck. And it wasn't until we started seeing distractive basilar skull fractures in motorsports that this became a textbook description, and it actually was in John Melvin's book. The second edition of his book is a paragraph about distractive basilar skull fractures in motorsports. And that's you know, the five NASCAR drivers that, that died, including Dale Earnhardt, from a distractive basilar skull fracture. Uh, we've had three IndyCar drivers that died as a result of a distractive basilar skull fracture. And this is what happens, and this is as simple as it gets. If your head is an olive and your neck is a toothpick and you suddenly stop the acceleration of the toothpick, your neck, with your head attached to it, your head flies off. Okay, what do you do to stop that? Really simple. You get a surgeon to put a stitch through your ears and tie it to the stick. That would be a Hans, right? It doesn't come off anymore. That's all you really need to know about a Hans. We're going to say this another <laughs> 10 different ways. But this is what causes a distractive um, basilar skull fracture. This car goes off the track. That's, you know, the Indy car is 16 feet long. That fence is 18 feet high. And it, it basically never touched the fence. It didn't break the fence. Car comes over lands upside down, the white thing's a helmet, helmeted head like a bell clapper. The driver was dead before he ever crossed the wall. He died when the car nosed into the tires and it, it started in the, the pole vault mode because his harness held him, but it didn't hold his head and neck. So it evolved, basically evolved his head. He had an internal decapitation. He was dead when I got to the car and I was on the other side of the track. I saw that happen. 
That was pre-Hans, no Hans. And actually, uh, General Motors did an analysis for us on that accident uh, to say whether or not the Hans would have altered the situation. And in a very politically collect, correct manner, they provided the data and drew the conclusion that it had the potential to have altered the outcome. Uh, we know now that it was more than just potential. So the, what the Hans or any frontal head restraint is designed to do is reduce the tension load on your neck. It's designed to prevent a basilar skull fracture. And it's designed to do that without increasing the neck compression, no rebound. So it can't act like a spring. It, it does do um, a number of things, and the numbers of how it does it are changing over time, have changed over time. But it's, the Hans was the first. It set all the standards. Uh, all of the specifications were built off and built around the way the Hans functions, which was extensively tested. And this is just one of the, the early demonstrations of, of with and without a Hans. And this is when it was a big, used to be very large. And that's a 40 G deceleration, the head's accelerating at 40 Gs. And you can see the elongation. And that, to Danny Sullivan's comment, we'd see guys hit their head on the steering wheel all the time. Uh, and they couldn't figure out how on earth they got their neck all the way down to the steering wheel. Well, we learned you, you get about a four inch excursion, but first of all, your neck doesn't stretch that far, the seat belts do. No matter how tight you put them, they're gonna stretch, and they do stretch. Um, there's some capability for your neck to elongate, but not the length that you see here in these pictures. But this is pretty realistic. This is without a Hans, and this is with. Watch that when it goes backwards, how, how much extension there is versus with the Hans, it's a pretty straightforward back and forth. And this is looking down on the same thing, looking down on it from the front. There's the face plant into the steering wheel without the Hans. And he doesn't make it to the steering wheel with. So it functions to keep your head attached to your body. And these are the specifications for it. Now, there is something that's important. I'm going to skip through these. There's a list. You can go online and find the list of all the SFI 38.1 devices. And they all have to pass the same thing. They have to keep your head fastened to your torso. Um, and there are modifications of the Hans. These are all the numbers. But what I want to get to is there has been some discussion about whether or not the Hans can cause or should it have prevented a neck injury. Okay. The Hans, the frontal head restraints are designed to hold your head on. They're not designed to prevent neck injury. So you can still have a broken neck and have a Hans on. And it's happened on a, a few occasions. We think it prevents a number of injuries that were more catastrophic than what we're seeing or have seen in the past. You know, knock on wood in an Indy car, we've not had a, a cervical fracture 2007? I can't remember when Pippa, but it was a very minor one that had to do with somebody altered the, the head surround in the car. But the combination of the frontal head restraint and our head surround limits neck motion so much that it's unusual uh, to see a, an injury. Now, one of the things that was worrisome is it was thought that the load path was such that it was moving um, the load into the upper back, and you saw people with, with uh, sort of upper thoracic fractures. And we looked at a number of uh, injury scenarios, people with fractures, and came to the conclusion really with a pretty wide base that there's no device uh, that's 38.1 compatible that has ever been implicated as having caused or contributed to a spinal fracture or dislocation. And, and that's an important point. There are some other devices that um, are being studied but haven't been proven. There's laboratory evidence to show that, that fractures like this can occur whether or not you have a Hans on. This, this is in a driver that had a Hans on, the white, the lighter coloration is those are broken vertebra, 
and then this one over here, but this was with no Hans. And they're very similar, the, the mechanisms, and this is just more of the same. This is a football player that ran into something with a helmeted head and had uh, those fractures. That's an ATV drive, driver with a helmet on that had an impact on a tree, and, and that's a fracture. None of these have anything to do with the Hans. However, they're similar types of fractures as seen in wearers of frontal head restraints. The point of this is the head restraints got nothing to do with the fracture. It's going to happen anyway, and it, it happens for a variety of reasons, and we've studied those at length. Um, but I'm here to tell you, and I, I can go through with you privately if you want, they do not cause neck or upper back fractures in of themselves. And that's the message, and that's really all there is to it.